Hello everyone, today we are back once again with the Economancer, the High Priest of the Economicon. Today, we're going to be going into a mildly controversial subject. Um, it's mildly con controversial from the academic standpoint, it's mildly controversial from, I guess, a sociology perspective. We're going to be looking at risk and inequality aversion. So, the reason why this is going to be mildly controversial is because a lot of this stuff isn't as empirical as it could be but we're going to be looking at it anyway and trying to derive, derive some conclusions that may help out within our view of society as it stands. So this is mostly gonna be a perspective um, on risk and inequality aversion given the, the foundations and fundamentals of the United States. So it's gonna be more appropriate to look at it and think of it from that level of perception. So as we're gonna go through, First, we're gonna to have to define these things. So what is risk and inequality aversion? These just sound like random words. So, so risk aversion essentially is a decision maker is risk averse if the expected utility under uncertainty uh, describes a decrease in preference to increasing risk. Wow, that, that's hard to swallow, but we'll continue. Uh, let's give an example. All right. So you're an investor and you want to put your money in something safe and secure. So you put it in a bank account. It has a low interest rate, but it's guaranteed. Someone who's more risk tolerant or risk loving, they're going to put their money in the stock market um, or in a stock that, you know, has a high return, but high volatility. So that means that they, they may get back a bunch of money or they may lose it all. So Plenty of people have heard my criticism about kind of like looking at investor strategies and saying, oh, this means you're risk averse or risk loving because, you know, it's all about that goal, what you're trying to attain. Uh, if if you can attain your goal with the easiest possible solutions and you might as well go with that. And that's kind of like that rational belief. Um, so it's it's not necessarily something that's directly correlated with your risk structure or whether you're risk averse risk tolerant risk neutral risk loving all of this stuff it may have nothing to do with that because you can find someone whose investment strategies is unbelievably conservative very slow growth uh long-term strategy but they smoke right so that one you know that's increasing risk uh they go skydiving all the time that's obviously something risky so your risk tolerance and your risk preference uh has many different domains but uh, we're kind of going to go with the idea of the investment strategy because it, it plays a lot along with this inequality aversion. So inequality aversion is essentially a person is considered adverse to inequity um, given that, they're, that they look at outcomes that are considered unequal or perceived inequitable. And a lot of people in the literature look at this from a fairness standpoint but the problem is is that fairness in this way is loaded so what you and i may consider fair is fundamentally different and this we'll actually get into this a little bit more when we look at it from the moral foundation theory but it's it's not a mode of being about what is fair so when we look at the original work that was done and inequality and inequity aversion it was fundamentally about how an individual felt when they were overcompensated or that the returns that they got for something was significantly bigger than what they initially expected so if you know, if everybody in the group is working together and the teacher gives you an A and everybody else in your in your group a C, despite the fact that you did equal amounts of work compared to all of your cohort, you're obviously going to be like, I don't know why. And you're going to have some cognitive bias against this. You're going to be like, this doesn't make any sense. I don't like this. And that was the original formulation of inequity aversion. Um, later, uh, some guys, Fair and Schmidt, they had looked at this and they said, Wow. What if we make a game where people just get unequal outcomes and see how they feel about that? The, you know, so a lot of these games are nominal. And what they found is that a lot of people would nominally give out some of their money um, to equalize the distribution within this set of games because it had maybe had nothing to do with them feeling that they should have or that they were overcompensated. It just they just wanted to equal out the distributions, right? So this raises the question, what could possibly be this connection, this artificial fact, we'll call it, 
uh, between risk and inequality aversion. What, what is the relationship? Well, first, let's logic through what inequity aversion uh, might be. So we can think of it from that initial way. It's a function of this internal issue, like guilt for possible overcompensation. Um, and this could also explain why an individual would choose a low risk, low return investment strategy. Because I don't think that me investing my money necessarily means I should get more. So I'm just going to put it in and get you know what the market value is, is of it increasing rather than getting something that i think may be an unequal distribution from my own perspective because i don't think what i'm going to do is going to matter that much um so this this idea this preference for obtaining more because you are this preference against obtaining more because you feel guilty can also be projected onto society, right? So this is this psychological projection that you're going to be having. You're going to go, well, I know that I'm not working hard to do X, Y, Z. So why should I gain more when I can look at somebody else and go, well, you're probably not working any harder than I am. Um, why should you get so much more? So that's kind of a fundamental thought. So how I perceive myself and my work may ultimately see how I see your work and think that you didn't work any harder than me or any harder than the other people that I that we are working with or together with. So why should this be a thing? So further uh, indication of this is looking at like two models. So the first one's going to be the big five factor of personality, and the second's going to be looking at moral foundations theory. So looking at the big five factor, um, there's been a few studies looking at the connection. Um, typically, they find some connection between those who are more risk adverse uh, to agreeableness, conscientiousness, and neuroticism. First, agreeableness. Uh, inequality may cause conflict inequity may cause conflict, you're going to want a more even distribution to reduce the amount of conflict because one, you don't want to deal with the conflict and two, you don't want to deal with other people's conflict. So that's kind of very simple that people who are high in agreeableness also tend to be highly uh, inequality averse and risk averse. Because again, you're not going to want to take more risks as an agreeable person. Why? Because taking these risks necessitates that you're in competition that you're moving farther and further um from just central positioning um you know that's that standpoint epistemology um so you're going to try to stay singularly within your own realm uh conscientiousness why would this have anything to do with it well if you're highly conscientious you're going to want a long-term growth pattern you're going to fundamentally think about what are the possible negative side effects and you're going to try to do them step by step. So you're going to want a long-term growth strategy that is fundamentally going to be safe because people who are highly conscientious are consistently looking forward to the future. Now, why would this have anything to do with uh, inequality aversion? One idea is that you perceive yourself to be working really hard, so you perceive others to be working really hard, so you're kind of wanting them to get the, the just desserts for their hard work since you want the just desserts for your hard work. Now, this gets opened up in the moral foundations theory on why this is kind of different. Um, and then we have neuroticism. This goes back to what I was just talking about, about the logic of you know this unequal distribution and how you feel about it. You're high in neuroticism, you're going to see this, this fundamental problem um, with yourself. So imposter syndrome is something that goes along with it. I don't feel like I, I belong here. You may project that out into others. Um, also, people who are high in neuroticism, why are they going to be lower in risk-taking? Is because they're going to substantially under... Uh, underbelieve in their own resources, right? So they're not going to think that they're going to be able to do as good or that if they take more risks, they're automatically going to lose, right? So it, the more risks I take, the more I'm going to lose, whether as something, someone who's open or extroverted, which is the opposite uh, for this risk loving matrix, someone who's extroverted, they're like, I'm always open. I'm always seeking new things. I'm going to go out. I'm talking to people. I'm more socially interactive. Um, so I'm definitely going to perceive the risk that I'm taking um, as having a reward at the end of the tunnel. 
because they're more likely to get out and talk to people, right? So if you're extroverted, you're probably more likely to take risks because you're going to walk up and talk to people, whereas an introvert may not necessarily. They may just kind of sit there and wait for people to come to them. They're not going to be antisocial, but they're not going to go out and take the risk of meeting people. So that's one function of it. And then the second is openness, right? So someone who's more open, they're going to be more willing to take risks because they're more creative. So that domain of creativity means, well, I got, I have to take risks. That's like the opposite of neuroticism, right? So they're going to think far more about the rewards that they're going to get for the actions that they're going to take. And that's just, again, a function of that personality to trait. Um, and so when we're looking at like this risk taking versus, you know, risk aversion matrix, we have to think that it's, it's self-selective. Um, and that's what I was talking about with that that competition matrix that we're looking at. So if you are more, more risk taking, you're going to seek out places that have more competition because it is a fundamental part of the more risk that you want. Now this goes into market strategy as well. It's like why are people who are more risk taking would want more unequal distributions It's because they perceive the risk that they're willing to take in line with what they should get in return. If I'm going out here and I'm fighting for resources on a day-to-day -day basis, I should get something in return for that. And so if you're more risk tolerant, you're going to seek the competition. If you're not, you're going to stay away from the competition, but you're also going to go, well, I should still get something. Um, and this kind of equals out the returns. And now this isn't to say that it's a negative or a bad thing. That's just kind of fundamentally the perception of individuals that have it. All right. So now when we look at moral foundations theory, we have this idea of fairness. So this goes back to what I was talking about earlier. So fairness doesn't exactly mean equity or equality. Fairness for a conservative means proportionality. Fairness for a liberal minded person means equality or equity. Now, when you map, you know, moral foundations on an individual, it's actually a bigger paradigm for what their political belief is than any of the other covariates. So by and far, one of the biggest disagreements that people have politically is how they see inequality, right? And we're gonna get into why this matters, but, but think of it this way. If I am an individual and I perceive fairness as everybody says, all right, everybody starts the same place, roughly speaking, and we all, at the end of the goal, we have different outcomes. That is perfectly normal under this system, especially if we think about it from the structural functionalist perception, right? That the function of society is a function of these disparate outcomes because the more highly selected and sought after divisions of labor are going to get better returns because it has more impact on society and also the returns that you will see are going to be greater to facilitate these differences in the division of labor that makes society function structurally right Woof. so the the degree of the degree of difference between equality and proportionality is is vast and it's the number one metric that you can use to gauge an individual's political preference, or at least it was. Um, there might be some changes that are happening now due to this cultural shift, but by and large, this was still fundamentally the most different. Now, what might be happening now is that we're actually seeing a more closer push towards equality. And so when we started pushing closer to equality, then you're going to have this dig at disaggregation of equality um, in and this may be like the difference between a liberal and a progressive, like a liberal wants something like social welfare to be increased. Whereas someone who's progressive may want to move into a system that equalizes all, and then may have some expected differences at the end. Whereas a liberal goes, well, we can have differences, but let's try to make those differences nominally smaller on a scale. Whereas conservatives may be moving closer towards this equality constraint, but they still maintain a lot of this um, proportionality. 
So it's getting disaggregated and, and pushed out across the different uh, uh, lines of this political process in the United States. So what was the point of psychologizing um, this demonstrable fact, right? So this is demonstrated. You can just walk down the street and ask 15 people. You'll get different answers. Why do I need to psychologize this? This is pretty simple. Everybody seems to know this, right? Well, first, um, economists and sociologists hate psychologizing things. Um, so first, that's good. Yeah. Second, uh, it sets up this, this idea that we're going to build onto when we look at society. So right now we have in this model, we have two opposing viewpoints, right? So these opposing viewpoints on this spectrum are kind of battling for power. And I don't mean power from the postmodern neo-Marxist conflict theorists. I mean, power as in the Talcott fu Parsons functional power paradigm. So we're going to look at this through basic, uh, uh, through social action theory by Talcott Parsons. So first, social action is always influenced by values, norms, morals. So the values or moral foundations are a guide to social action, which are used to motivate the action. So this is the foundation of structural conditioning of the social system. And in this, we're going to be using the AGIL system by Talcott Parsons. It's agile from now on. We can see how these characteristics play out in society. First, A, adaptation. The capacity of society to interact with their environment, allocation of resources, production, and social redistribution. G, goal attainment, the capability of society to set goals for future and to make decisions regarding those future goals. So this is where politics live. Integration, harmonization of the entire society is a demand for the norms and values of the society to be sufficiently convergent such that society itself works fundamentally, right? Now, this is, this is the big problem in current U.S. structure and society. Not to say that what the left may believe or what the right may believe may be the right answer. Fundamentally, that doesn't matter. You need to have these opposing viewpoints so that you can continuously come to some conclusion. But the problem is when the rules have no conformity. So when the rules shift away from conformity, so we're not all able to compete on the same ground because the rules are changing and shifting and stuff like that, then you can't really compete within that system. And that becomes a fundamental problem on how individuals interact. And it leads to this wildness that we have going on right now. So then we're going to get into L, the latency. So latent pattern maintenance, um, this challenges society to maintain the integrative elements. Um, so social institutions such as school, family, church, etc., all of these, uh, they have a feedback on behavior. So when you act out or act in some way, you receive feedback from these institutions, um, and this stabilizes your behavior to be a part of the cultural norms, which allows then for convergence. Now, this doesn't say that you can't be different or that it takes away the way we look at different people. It just means that for us to come to some consensus within society, because this is consensus theory, not conflict theory, we have to have some overarching value structure that we're all seeking. And that's that goal. If everyone has different goals, everyone's playing by different rules, then there's no way that we can have this adaptation strategy. And there's no way that we can have this integration. And that's fundamentally a problem that comes from the latency. Now, there's a lot of reasons why, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. So what was the purpose of this? Okay, so let's mix it all together. So this is kind of going to get a little difficult to understand. I wanted to do some math for this, but I figured it would be best to leave the math to guys like Jeremy Von Stippelhelm III and Econ John. Um, if you're trying to look into the math, go see them. They have plenty of videos on this, and I think they do a fantastic job. I can't do better than them in that regard, so go watch them. They'll help you. So a country's coefficient of relative risk aversion correlates with a taste for redistribution first what does a country's uh 
coefficient of relative risk aversion tell us? Well, typically when it's modeled, um, it's modeled as the inverse of the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. So this is the responsiveness of the consumption growth rate to the real interest rate. So yeah, this may affect some of the re results um, that go into these models. Um, there's plenty of criticisms um, along the lines that, you know, it may introduce bias and stuff like that. But again, go watch Jeremy Von Stippelheim III or Econ John, they'll give you a, a great breakdown of some of these issues. Anyways, a lot of this started in the 1970s by uh, Dr. Atkinson. Um, so he constructed an inequality scale similar to the risk scale. Um, essentially, if you've ever heard in my tax, uh, in any of the videos that I've done on taxes, so when we aggregate these utilities all together and we make this one utility graph right that was fundamentally what atkinson had done and he did that through this risk aversion model and that's where we get into all these different types of distributive justice right whether it's the median voter or rawlsian theory of re redistributive justice or just utilitarian di distribution of justice at the end of the day they all kind of fundamentally answer the same question um, and that those at the bottom, uh, a $1 change in their you know, utility is bigger than what happens to those at the top with the $1 change. So it makes sense that you would take from the top to give to the bottom because that increases the total social welfare by way of utility and so atkinson was the guy who fundamentally created all of this it's a fantastic paper it's going to be linked down below as all the other citations are in this um so some people avoid risks and prefer safer things and some people prefer prefer a more equal society and avoid overcompensation now two things to think about here what has been the historical trend of the United States and how has consensus rather than conflict moved policy and perception? So historically speaking, now this isn't just the United States, this is humanity. Historically speaking, humans have been incredibly unequal in nearly everything. Even the inequality itself has been unequal. By nominal standards, our world is more equal than ever and i'm sure there's plenty of people that make the argument about you know hunter gatherer societies being more or less equal in comparison to ours i'm i am skeptical of this um i think the outcome is ambiguous on whether or not that's true first of all it fundamentally didn't work uh so they had to shift strategies right so fundamentally it wasn't good for them it wasn't a great life um and second though it might be more equal in some parameters it was probably vastly more unequal in other um and then at the end of the day it, it wasn't sustainable for humans or anything else uh, no more than it is today so why has there been a decline in inequality well one thing to note is this obvious evolutionary answer so if you're familiar with the evolution of religion then this might make sense to you so anyway the evolution of religion says that if you have two societies they're competing to be better than each other right and you have one society that worships a sun god and one society that worships a moon god right uh, over time this society that's worshiping the sun god because they're doing more things involving the sun and crops and stuff like that they're more prosperous and this other society that's praying to the moon god, they're, they're having some crop failures and they're having some issues, but they see what the other society is doing. They're like, well, maybe my god doesn't work. Maybe their god is better. And so that fundamentally moves them to adopt that religious strategy. Um, and you can think of the same thing here. If you're competing societies and you see this more equal society com out competing you, you're going to be more likely to adopt their societal strategy so that you can have better outcomes. And this is 
this is a, par a paradigm that most kings and stuff like that would follow, even though they're in the greatest control and they have a significantly better life than others, they're still more likely, may maybe not that individual king, but as their kingship or whatever grows, they're going to be more likely to adopt because they still see that king who's at the, at the top of that one have more than what they have. So it's still in their best interest to act out that, you know, economy, that country, that society. Anyway, so this raises the question into this heterogeneity of outcomes that we have. Why do we have these heterogeneous outcomes then? If societies are moving closer and closer and closer to like just strict equality, why haven't we got there yet? Why do we have disparate outcomes like Sweden and the United States? Well, for me, I think there's a strong relationship to this, this function of risk tolerance. Now, what does that mean? So if we think of risk tolerance as a function of culture, if you have a society with a strong relationship to a hero myth, then they are probably more likely a risk-loving society. Um, this phenomenon can most likely be attributed to like pro-social behavior along the lines of you know, supposed diffusion of responsibility. And what do I mean by that? It's like, so the by, bystander effect, uh, there's, a, there's a good bit of research into the hero and the bystander effect. The hero is someone who goes, uh, that they're not as affected by this bystander effect because they take on more individual personal responsibility upon themselves. And so they act out this kind of manifestation of the hero, right? And so if you have a strong relationship within your society, with a hero myth, you're gonna have a higher risk tolerance. And as we've already kind of established when it comes to risk tolerance, it's very closely associated with our inequality aversion. So that would be one reason why you have a disparate outcome between the two different. All right, so now we're gonna go back to that agile system, agile model. The adaptation of, or the adoption of society began to understand that more people meant more workers, more ideas, and total economic growth. By providing others with less unequal outcomes, um, this pro provides more trust, which turns into an idea of providing more uh, total goods and services. And this allows for goal attainment strategies that are together, as well as this integration, and it makes it easier for this latent pattern maintenance. Further, if you look at the introduction of dem democracy and its variants, um, you have something that's the median voter rule, which essentially says that you can't find everybody's preference. So you have to find like this median voter, this, excuse me, this total center preference that can kind of expand and grab the most amount of people, right? So that's kind of that. Um, and even in like small group settings between teams and individuals, when they're getting together to kind of come up with social preferences, there's still a strong preference for this median social that drives these team decisions. Um, and so you're going to have this disparate outcomes on risk and inequality tolerances that are going to be mitigated by this median voter rule or this median social preference. So as society grows, that median is probably going to find a more reliable center. Finally, um, there may be no known like causal link between the two, but there does appear to be a good amount of crossover where countries with high entrepreneurship, which is a function of risk, um, coincide with lower levels of social welfare. I know, mind blowing. Probably going to catch some backlash on that, but I'll talk about it. So let's look at the difference between the U.S. and Sweden, right? Now, before I read the rebuttals in the comments, I, I, I already know social welfare in the United States facilitates entrepreneurship. Yes, that's true. But again, it's the level of your society's tastes for risk and inequality. The Swedish welfare system is far more robust and economically equal. So you're socializing a lot of the risk but you're also socializing a lot of the reward. 
So then you have the US. You're going to socialize some of the risk and you're going to socialize some of the reward, but there's more risk and more reward. So you're gonna have more entrepreneurship. So if, if we're kind of looking at this, if, if you have a society that doesn't have much of a reward strategy, then those who are more risk loving aren't really facilitated to take more risks, are they? The, the risks are all socialized and the rewards are all socialized. So there's not really much that they can do. So there's not a big motivation towards this entrepreneurship strategy. Um, and if you are a society that doesn't socialize most of the rewards, then you're necessarily going to be a more unequal income distribution. And if we think about this from the agile system, um, we have historically seen in the U.S., for example, hero myths propagated, you know, Rockefeller, all of these things. Um, then we've seen this push throughout most of our history on individual responsibility and individual liberty, which leads to this, you know, risk reward ratio that we kind of got going on where we're, you know, more risk and more reward, less of it socialized. And then we have this like focus on long-term economic growth, right? So going back to that elasticity of inter in intertemporal substitution, man, that's hard. Um, America appears to have favored consumption in the long run, right, in our society. So it's less about measuring our aggregate utility. It's best about measuring the next generation's aggregate utility. So that's kind of, that strategy has been throughout most of our time. You know, growing up, I heard my mother say, well, I want you to have a better life than me. So she would scrimp, save, and do all these things so that I had something. And then this generation... Um, as noted by, you know, Jonathan Haidt and other researchers in this, have noticed that there is a lot less of this going on after what's called the iGen or the Internet generation. It's kind of the split for millennials um, leading into the Z generation. Um, so what, what do they look like? Well, they're more politically divisive. Um, there's a rising epidemic of mental health issues. Um, they have lower risk tolerance, lower inequity tolerance. Um, and overall, it's just this switch in generations that we did not expect. Um, this comes from Carl Mannheim's work in generational overlap theory and how generation to generation, we actually transfer a good portion of our underlying values into our children, etc. Um, but it's typically what changes happen are typically small. But with the iGen, we actually see this vast change in like, what's going on. Um, now there's plenty of reasons why there it is, but just looking at on that there is, um, we're gonna tie this back up and try to make this as neat as possible using the agile system. So we are seeing structural changes due to the changes or lack of latency uh, pattern maintenance in the United States. So this drives one, a chaotic system. So because we're in so much chaos within our political landscape, um, this reinforces risk aversion, which reinforces inequity aversion, right? Um, and this is especially noted after a major economic meltdown like the great recession so if you see the great depression one two generations and then it starts going back into this more inequitable distribution and then after you know the 2008 crash we started seeing this push for more equitable distribution so economic downturns fundamentally shape some of the reality that people vote on all right two we're going to see risk uh, taking as an exogenous source of growth. Now, that may sound crazy because you've always heard me say that risk, entrepreneurship, that's endogenous, you know, so we have endogenous growth theory. Why would this be exogenous? And I mean that in the fact that entrepreneurship in the U.S. is declining in the natural population. And I don't mean anything bad about that, but what I'm saying is a lot of the risk taking, a lot of the entrepreneurship isn't a function of people born in America, second, third generation. So those who are moving to America are highly entrepreneur. They're highly risk taking. Um, so that's one difference. Whereas those 
in the US aren't as apt or necessarily want to be entrepreneurs. Um, so this is gonna, you know, this is gonna be the people who are producing the ideas and moving economic growth forward aren't really a part of the US. They're people being imported into the US to do these things. So that's kind of a big failure on our part. So how are we supposed to deal with this? Um, they're coming here and they're being advantaged by the clusters that have been built here, but we're not fundamentally shaping it ourselves. Um, and I don't care about the national versus international or globalist argument or anything like that. I'm just saying as a general idea on this agile system, it's hard for the system to function that way because those who are actually making the moves aren't even a part of the system. So they're going to have a say in the function of the system in the long run, while others do not. And again, that may be a good thing, it may be a bad thing, but it's a part of the chaos that's being brought into the system, and it makes it hard for the system to stabilize and equilibrate. All right. Uh, also, I don't think the system can sustain itself doing that very long. Uh, eventually, you know, looking at like India, extending over their best and being a part of our clustering strategy, they're eventually gonna go back to India to build their own clusters. And then, then what are we gonna do? We're not gonna have anything. Our clusters, our basic sectors, as, as you've heard me talk about hundreds of times, they're going to collapse in upon their own weight and without anything there to facilitate it, um, it's not gonna go well. It's gonna be very bad. It's gonna drive crime rates through the roof. Um, it's not good for society. So that's a big problem. Third, um, increasing inequity aversion in a voting system becomes highly controversial um, along generation lines. And so what do I mean by that? Um, we're getting away from like this appropriate median social preference. There appears to be more divisiveness and politically and socially, um, and these extremes tend to be much louder than the more likely optimal economic solution. So the median social preference and the median voter preference, they've, they've worked for many, many years. They've been highly, highly successful. And as we're in society now, just looking at it, we're seeing these shifts. We're seeing where instead of back in the day, it used to be higher social welfare, versus you know less social welfare more risk taking or less socializing risks but higher rewards um and then the opposite was true now we're seeing where people like some of the republican parties and the austrians and the objectivists they are a big portion of this growing republican party movement they're more along the lines of even less socializing of the risk, less social or more um, or less socializing of the reward, and then you have some of the progressive Democrats. They're they're pushing more for more socializing risk and more socializing um, the rewards, uh, almost to the point that you know socialism, quote unquote, and things like that are on the rise. So we're just having these vast differences between these two political parties, and so as those two become so much further apart, it's harder to find that median voter social preference or that median voter economic preference. And that fundamentally creates problems in how we perceive society. It fundamentally makes the political landscape look like an absolute mess that we see now. And it changes the moral foundations that we're trying to look at, like I was talking about earlier. like. It would make sense from the conservative point of view to do this or the liberal point of view to do this. But when we add in the progressive and then we have this like libertarian perspective, it makes it significantly harder to deal with. And I think that under this agile system, there does need to we do need as a society to go back to some of this latent pattern maintenance and you know fundamentally change our goal so the goal of the united states has been long-term economic growth and it seems like we're moving towards this equality and that works fine if you want to make the the playground more equal that makes sense to you it doesn't make sense to me to me this long-term economic growth is actually going to grow the utility vastly more if we assume that we're going to have more economic growth 
then generation on generation, that utility is higher. If you equal the playground and you don't have as much growth, then there's not really a whole lot getting better. And I think this is a fundamental difference in strategy. And it's my preferred strategy to worry about that long run economic growth and about that generational utility change, even though the outcomes are not equal, even though there is a vast disparity, if the outcomes in absolute terms are significantly better, then I don't necessarily put much emphasis on this relative difference, right? So absolute over relative. We'll get into that one of these days. At the end of this, we talked about risk and inequity aversion. We've kind of given like a full background. We've psychologized it. We've looked at it from sociology. We've kind of given it a treatment when it comes to economics. It's a very broad and open uh, case study on the changes that are happening in America. I hope you've learned something. I hope this was fun. This was 40 minutes long. I did not expect this to be 40 minutes long, um, but you'll see the references down under. Uh, it's, it's a very big reference uh, or a very big bibliography. Uh, I invite all of you to go read some of these papers. If you have comments, questions, or concerns about any of the things that I've said in this video, please leave them down below. Um, if you find something in the literature that may be persuasive, please link it down below. We'll, I'll look at it. I even may even do a video on it. Um, with that being said, the next few videos that are going to be coming out, I might be doing another video on or finishing up that video on the paradoxes of <clears throat> what is it? Neoliberalism. I probably won't. That that did not get any views. I did not get much going on with it. Uh, it didn't seem like people enjoyed that very much, but we'll see how this one does. If you would like more content like this, let me know down below. Um, but anyway, I hope you have a wonderful day and thank you.